All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another session of Life Examined online. We are back again for the third week in a row. And uh, you might not recognize me because my beard disappeared, but I'm Joshua Bronson. I'm part of Life Examined uh, in Gothenburg. And Life Examined, just to say what we do, we are about helping people uh, improve their lives by being more self-reflective. That is to think about their philosophical ethos. And their philosophical ethos is the, the way that they think about the world and how they navigate through the world. And we're interested in doing that in the wisest way possible. So being wise about how we live in the world. Uh, and that's what we do. We do live events. Obviously, we don't do live events now because of coronavirus. So we're doing online events at the moment. Yeah, uh, my name is Miriam. I'm also in Gothenburg. And um, so what we're doing today is we're trying, we're playing Socrates a little bit mm. by asking each other open ended questions to clarify and to make sure that we're consistent in our lines of thought. Um, we're helping each other I think so the, the the whole thing that with um, philosophical practice and what we do together as life examined is to help each other think because uh, thinking out loud together will um, ensure is a safer path to this wisdom seeking that we're after mm -hmm. wisdom seeking activity that's what we're doing so today um, today Matt has a topic that he's brought to the table uh, we have uh, had a sneak peek of it, of it, but we don't really know what he's going to say. <laughs> I don't. I don't either. So this is good. <laughs> Makes it yeah. exciting. We never know where these conversations will end. We do know that they're never as short as we uh. <laughs> think in the beginning. We can do this in fifteen minutes. No, we can't. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's Excellent. see. Yep. Anything else, yeah. Miriam? No. Oh, yep. well, we, we could say that the, the tagline for Life Examined is live interactive philosophy. And that's that's what we're going to be doing right now. It's it's live and it's interactive. We're, we're talking with each other and we're doing philosophy. All right. Excellent. Um, my name is Matthew Nowacek and I am here in Lund. Uh, and I'm going to be responsible for giving us the topic today. And I thought what we would talk about is the topic of nostalgia. Now, what we do in Life Examine is we always want to get to larger issues, and I'm hoping today we can get to issues of politics and yeah. economics, morality, and so forth. But we usually find that the best way to get there is to start with a very concrete example and kind of work our way up. Mm. So I would like to begin with a concrete example. In 2015, I was finishing up my PhD, getting really close to the end, and after essentially 17 years of studying, uh, I was beginning to face the end of this process with no really clear step forward. What was going to be the next thing? And at that point, I found myself quite down. If you ask my wife, she would wow. even say I was borderline depressed. Um, and in the middle of this, it was strange, but I, I found myself incredibly drawn mm. to games, uh, in particular board games, card mm. games, sort of miniature games that I had played a ton when I was a teenager, but I hadn't thought about for like 20 years. <laughs> and suddenly now, here I am <laughs> in 2015, obsessed with these games. Oh. And so I played them a ton. I was reading rule books. I was uh, watching YouTube videos. I was just wow. going all about these games. Um, and now today, five years later, I'm done with the PhD, um, but I'm still playing games. And in fact, now I've begun to teach these games to my kids. And what I what I get from this example is that there's there's some sense of nostalgia at play here. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but I want to raise some questions today. Um, questions like, well, what what is nostalgia as a phenomenon? How should we understand it? How is it related to identity? Uh, how is it related to morality? Um, what how how does it fit into a picture of the good life and existence? And of course, there are going to be larger questions. I hope we get into nostalgia in politics, nostalgia in economics. Hmm. And a good question to end with is, what can we learn from the phenomenon? Does it have something to teach us about what it means to be human? Hmm. And there I will throw it back to you guys and let you run away with that topic wherever you want to take it, and I will join you on the, on the journey. Nice. I love this topic. I love this. Can I go first? I have this. Go first. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's, I, 
I love that you brought up the 90s and these yeah. board games and the, <laughs> the, that it starts with a kind of crisis. What's the future going oh. to be like um, situation? Because I, as you can see, I am now wearing this jumper that I bought for my own money in 1994. <laughs> Oh. 26 years ago and it's about probably the first thing that I bought for my own money and I still own this and I have been wearing it so much these past weeks it's been in a box for like a few years of these 20, 26 years but I've really been wearing it and I love it so much and I was thinking about uh, one of the things that really gets me through um, this corona time mm -hmm. is this BBC series called Midsummer Murders and I oh, mean yes. the old yeah, I mean the old episodes from the 90s, from like yeah. 99 is the latest, with him, um, John Nettles, not the yeah. other guy, like the older one. The younger and, one. <laughs> yeah, and in these, they have on TV here, they have like two one and a half hour episodes in a row, and I never watch TV. My family will tell you, I, I never watch TV, and now I'm sitting mm. at a Saturday night and Sunday oh. night, I'm watching Poirot and Midsummer Murders. And Midsummer Murders, they're almost always set in the summertime, and uh, they, uh, so, so I love that. And then there's an, this other thing about Midsummer Murders, and that's that, um, um, so the um, um, Chief Inspector Barnaby, the main character, <laughs> he can't cook at all. So when his wife oh. is going away, he's like, well, how long are you going to be away? And he's like, don't worry, Callie will come home. Like the daughter, the, who, is, <laughs> who is just, and so she cooks for him. And then when, when someone is doing, um, uh, something crazy new agey like yoga everyone's like rolling their eyes going like oh and then you're looking at this person who is completely strange and weird and talks to spirits and things like that mm. um and it's really uh, when someone is a vegetarian they're also rolling their eyes so so these are obviously not because no, if nostalgia means something like happy memory mm. uh, or something like that so this is a kind of um this is a kind of nostalgia which brings me back to the now and um, how glad I am that we've come so far. Can you see the strange, it's like a, it's like, um, uh, it's like I'm living out this battlefield inside mm. where mm. I'm just bringing back the, the, the times of my, uh, I'm, I'll be 41 this year, so I turned 20 in 99. So this like the, my later teen years and just just oh. this time when I grew up, mm. like, you know, the nine, the nineties, the time when I became my own person with my own sense of style and, you know, this really important time. So I'm going back to that yet uh, and I'm embracing it yet saying goodbye to it. See, like, uh, isn't that, I, that and I'm really, I've been really thinking about this, mm. this stranger. I'm like, when, when it's too much on social media, too much, uh, uh, because I don't read the news, but I get the news from social media from people putting articles up mm. um when it's too much of that i have i get this feeling i have to watch midsummer murders is the midsummer murders tonight <laughs> you know <laughs> because it will it will help me it will calm me and it will get me back on track again to the future that i want you see what i'm saying is that something that has increased since the the corona time was, for you yes it was non-existent mm. before corona yeah. Okay, I think I think that's that's interesting because I think that's that's rather instructive. I, I guess in your case, your example that, um, yeah, and I guess also my example that there is a sense in which nostalgia seems to cre creep up in in the midst of times of uncertainty or crisis, um, crisis perhaps. Yeah, Josh, yeah. you were in. What? The same yeah, there. just say what because um, that's that's. Those are both quite interesting. What t what kind of uncertainty? Uh, so so uh, one of the things that we try to do in terms of a Socratic dialogue, right? Is to try to go from these specific examples and try to move towards getting a, a, a more general principle. So I'm curious, like, because both of you have quite different examples uh, yeah. of, of a kind of crisis. Uh, what's, what would you say is the, the feature of the crisis that pushed you each to sort of reach for some sort of um, nostalgic feeling maybe i'm not sure if nostalgia is a feeling but reach for something to address uh the, the moment because because both of you were talked about something in the moment uh yeah it's the time. we're talking about this unknownness finishing right. your PhD, this unknownness uh, and the coronavirus at the moment but but they're they're very different kinds of crises so 
Yeah, can you say a bit more about that? Maybe, they, maybe they're quite similar. Maybe it's because it's we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we look to the oh. past and, you know, and then we want to, mm. uh, yeah. So this crisis doesn't come up if you're on the road to, um, you know, if you just started your PhD you, or in your, if you're in the middle of it, you pretty much know what you, and then you don't know when it's, when it ends, you're like, what will the future mm. be like? And, and none of yeah. us know that now. Mm. How long will this go on? Like two or three years? You know, what will change and how will we do things? Is it the unknown? Is it the solidity of the past and the unknownness of the future? Do you think that leads to this this sense of reaching to something backwards? Would that be what you would say, Matthew? I I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think trying to think of the example, my own example, is it seems... I mean, there's a temporal aspect of this. Absolutely, yeah. there's a time thing. I yeah. mean, these are emotions that are looking backwards in time. Yeah. Um, but I guess... There, for me, I think identity seems to make more sense. The terms of identity that that in order to um, be able to continue to move forward as a person, as a, as a, a an identity that has continuity um, in in times of uncertainty. So to connect to what you said, Miriam, when that next step isn't clear. Uh, I think one way in which to do that is to, to sort of get a boost from what has been in the past. But I'm I'm well aware that this is this is really can be messy and problematic because the the memories or what we're looking back to is not always a true representation of how things were. It's, it's maybe a glorified version of it that I'm in some sense drawing on to move forward. Um, but I mean, it's it's yeah. Josh, throw it back to you there. I mean, uh, does yeah. that help? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I was just gonna uh, two two things. Uh, one thing was I was really surprised, Miriam, that you you mentioned uh, Midsummer Murders and how you like the summer, but you didn't say you like murders. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought you were gonna go. <laughs> you were gonna say, I mean, you know, it's all this nice summery feeling, and, and then there's murders, which is just great. <laughs> Yeah, the the way they pro portray murders is uh, there. Uh, there's like no real suffering like that it's no, a, i was a huge fan of uh, agatha christie uh, yeah. and this is the same type it's not it's not like traumatic it's not suffering it's more like you see this shadow and a big knife it's like very theatrical and yeah. and silly it's like you, you do not get frightened by watching this no. that's the key if if uh, and the newer versions i get a little, little bit frightened like the newer from the 2000s and i don't <laughs> well, don't like them you know the whole point is i, I don't want to get frightened i don't i never no. watch scary mm -hmm. things Never yeah. ever. So that's, that's that, uh, yeah. That's really but funny I that you <laughs> mentioned yeah. the newer the newer ones from twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> from from like eighteen years ago, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, about the temporal and the the like happy memory and like uh, this jumper, for instance. So this this jumper got me through uh, mm. so many years in my teens. Mm. So I was fifteen in nineteen ninety four. And it meant so much to me and I've worn this so much and it's such a big part of my identity. Mm. But it, I would never, ever, ever, ever want to go back to 1994. No. no. Right. Or 1999. I don't want to be live in a time right. where people roll your eyes and think, oh, you're a vegetarian. You know, and there's, huh. there, there's a, a character and he's like, I can't eat anything here. There's no meat. You know, it's very, very, <laughs> it's so right. conformist and like, and it's, but it's... So I mean that, that's it because you, you guys both picked up on this sense of identity and that that's quite that's quite interesting in terms of uh, identity going into the future. So there's a sense in which we look to the past to what re remind ourselves, build on. Is it built? So so you're building on it. it I mean, there's also a there's Question. also a reminder. I right? I guess what's the difference between being reminded of? Because in a way, I, I would think that. It's good to be reminded of where you've been yeah. to know where you're going, right? Mm -hmm. Which might be different right. than building on. I mean, I mean, it might be yeah. both, right? I mean, there, there might be multiple things going on. And it seems like there might be different kinds of nostalgia at, at work here. And if you want to try and clarify here, um, that um, so if we so it seems like it seems like all the cases if we can identify something that unites them. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong here, but it seems like there's a perceived lack of something in the present. Mm. Um, and we then look mm. to the past and how we use the past maybe uh, mm. dictates the different kinds of nostalgia. So yeah. if I can use two different examples, um, maybe one example was um, 
uh, this sort of nostalgia for wilderness that came in the sort of uh, 19th, 20th century America uh, after the, the frontier had ended. The frontier yeah. was no longer a thing anymore. And so yeah. suddenly the wilderness uh, environmental movement started picking up because people were having this nostalgia for this this old frontier. Um, yeah. And in that case, I don't, I can see how it, if it leads to environmentalism, it, it is producing something positive, but it seems to be a longing for something that's that can't be reclaimed and yeah. almost a, there's a sorrow, yeah. there's a there's a pain and a, and a lasting sorrow with that. Um, a yeah. different example might be something like um, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy talks about this sort of longing we have for community. And when we're in the sort of modern world that we are so disconnected from one another, we have this sort of nostalgic longing for community. And that can be a really good thing if it leads us then to seek community with others. Maybe those are two different examples that show that, that one is, is yearning for something that cannot be reclaimed. Uh, I can't yeah. really even really be renewed, the, the frontier idea. And the other one is rec- longing for something that can be renewed in a, in a sense, mm. some sort of mm. fellowship that, that, although looks different, is perhaps something that is still of the mm. same kind. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. That's nice. Yeah. An- another way of yeah. uh, seeing uh, those two, it's, it's great. We're getting somewhere. We have these two different versions now. Perfect. Um, so uh, these two versions, like Jacques Lacan would say, the psychoanalyst, he would he would talk about the the paradise that we've lost, and we mm. didn't know, even know we had it until we lost it through language. When we can talk about this sense of mm. uh, oceanic sense of safety, uh, for instance, complete let safety um, and warmth, mm. and it's lost and it's gone, and we can never get it back because we're trapped in the sphere of talking and language and meta we're like separated from the core of blah, blah. so that's mm. the the can never reclaim kind of nostalgia that we, uh-huh. we are doomed to always long for almost like a lost innocence or something yes yes a lost mm. paradise lost paradise the fall you know this yeah this kind of thing yeah and the other part is um when you when i'm like almost what i'm doing you now looking for the it, it better the devil you know than the devil you don't know yeah. So yeah. The, the devil of the nineties, I know. So I'm gonna mm. like be there, sit there in my right. me, in my protective jumper and watch these mm. um, silly series where people are conformist and and they don't like. Mm. And if you say the word spiritual, it's like, uh, you know. The, so and we have we have left that world, and it's fantastic and wonderful. And finally, mm. I'm not so weird anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's still. And then if I look a bit longer in the future, I will see that the new devil might not even be a devil. Mm. So that's what I mean. Like, uh, you know, mm. it's it's still like the, the same category where I'm looking for. Right. And it's fascinating, though, Mary. You're you're very clear that you do not want to return to that. Yeah. Uh, even oh, if yeah. I mean, it's not even possible, but you, you yeah. don't even have that desire to return to that. It's not a longing to return to that. It's it's this sort of emotional relation to something in the past that has relevance for now, for your present. So, but there are, uh, but I take it that sometimes nostalgia is a longing to return. Mm-hmm. So, 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 like, like I mean, the, 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 I, yeah. we pulled it out a couple of different kinds of nostalgia, perhaps, right? Um, uh, but sometimes it seems like, especially in political discourse, right, you get a uh, a way of talking about the past which becomes a narrative that is aimed at making a change towards the past right to to re to reconstitute something to right. bring something back in a way right right and that's obviously not always a, a bad thing i mean there are some things in the past that were fantastic right mm. which is really nice to have uh maybe there are some things that aren't but but there there's something about the nostalgic feeling of looking back to a I mean, you know, kind of a golden age, right? Like the time when things were were as they should be or they were right. good in some particular way. But I, I, I mean, I guess I guess I'm trying to look at the feeling, right? Because there's, right. there's two different things. You might be able to look at some particular uh, way that the world was and say that was good. Maybe something like the wilderness or, or I don't know, uh, yeah. in, in the West, in the US or something. But then there might be something where it's not so much the way things really were, but it's a longing for, uh, longing for being in that particular state. 
Right. And and that seems, I mean, when you bring up politics, I mean, that seems to yeah. be quite a common move, especially the, the more conservative you get. I mean, and we talk about in yeah. Sweden here, the, the Sweden Democrats talk a lot about returning to this the way yeah. Sweden was, the old Sweden, right? Um, yeah. Appeals to some kind of old Europe and, and yeah. Christianity. Um, America has its own versions of this, making yeah. America what, what it was uh, with a, maybe a picture of the 1950s or something. Uh, but and I, I guess that is a sense of trying actually to yeah. reclaim. But maybe that's the political political realization or use mm-hmm. of a nostalgic experience of the public uh, to try yeah, and get some sort of political mileage out of it. But I was just – because you mentioned Swedish Democrats, but uh, which are on the, the right. But you get the same kind of uh, nis- play on nostalgia on the left in Sweden where mm-hmm. there's a sense that going back to the 60s – Right is is when when you know when the Swedish um, welfare state was at its height and everybody had everything wonderful you know and, I mean there's right. this there's this picture of of that we've we've gone away from a golden age in Sweden and and this is a kind of nostalgic story mm. right it's a nostalgic story that we need to you know things have become uh, overly privatized. It's become right. all about money. It, we need to go back to the time. This, this is, I mean, if, if if people don't live in Sweden, they're not going to recognize this kind of narrative. Yeah. But, but we see it all the time here. Absolutely. So it's on the yeah. left and the right. So the left and the right. Mm. And maybe it's important because that actually maybe is telling, right? That, right. Yeah. that mm. both political sides, they need a sense of connecting us to a, a past that we identify with. Right. Yeah. And this and is, a, I mean, this is a powerful emotion. Yeah. yeah, so it's not exactly. it's not strange that that yeah. I mean both sides would want to use it. It's not strange, um, yeah. for example, that companies would want to use this. I mean, yeah. if we think about marketing commercials, yeah. I mean, think I, I was starting to think about this this morning before we signed in here about how many commercials mm. and advertising plays yeah. on this idea of nostalgia to reclaim something that was in the past. Um, you but, think about midlife crises. Yeah. I mean, that those are built on this. I mean, go buy that car, you know, that you yeah. had when you were 25 years old and drive yeah. around town like you're a young guy again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Miriam. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking because we could, um, of course, if you're trying to appeal to, if you want to say to someone, remember this lovely feeling that you had yeah. uh, when you come to my gang, uh, you can have that lovely feeling feeling again. Yeah. So of course that will always be nostalgia since for the simple reason that we don't remember the future. So yeah. so when you Good. when you try to describe a feeling you have to use the imagery of something that has already been and hope that that triggers this feeling in mm. in people. But this is uh now I'm feeling like oh, now it's like suddenly t- my brain is tickling at the moment. But um, because this feeling, this feeling, remembering, what is the difference between remembering a feeling and feeling it? I mean, yeah, there is no difference, right? Well, there is no difference. No, there, there is. <laughs> I think. No. Well, I mean, it seems uh, like no, there's there a couple of things going Tell on me. here. You can, you yeah. can have a feeling, you can yeah. have a memory of a feeling, and you can have a feeling that is the result of a memory of a feeling. Yeah. So how do, how does that differ in your in your like impulses in the brain? I think they do. I think they do differ. Phenomenologically, they differ. <laughs> right? Phenomenologically, they differ in, in the sense of the way in which it feels. It's like, it, I mean, there, there's there's a certain way that you feel when you have a, an immediate response to something in your environment. So let's say, let's say you get scared. So mm. so you know you're 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 in the moment of being afraid. Yeah, uh, you have a you know there's a there's a quickening there's a there's a a, a rush of adrenaline or whatever it is right? there's this feeling of it, um, and that in, in terms if you want to talk about qualia the the what it's likeness of that feeling, that's a that's one kind of experience. It's another kind of experience to have the memory of being afraid. You might remember oh I was so afraid last night, but that wouldn't bring the same the same rush of emotion. You might have some right. of it. But not quite the same. It's a different type of experience. Yes. Okay. So let me put it differently. Of um, so fear is like the, is the perfect example, I think. Yeah. Because um, yeah. So be uh, and because fear is, is is at least for me, you know, it if I if it if I get a little bit afraid, I get into this whole black hole of fear, you know. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, and there, it, um, it um, what makes you afraid can be both things that are dangerous and both yeah. thing, and things that are scary. Yeah. 
you know so the same the same kind of panicky black hole feeling mm. that you can get if you are standing in front of a tiger i'm just imagining it never happened to me <laughs> who's an angry tiger and from like reading something which yeah. happened to me you know yeah. so this this um type of there i can i i will mm. propose that uh, it looks the same in the brain you know these two states of mind but the and uh, so there also when i'm like mm. when i'm recounting the story mm. of having been uh, frightened that's not really the same as um um uh, if i have been uh, if these emotions of i'm changing emotion now if the emotion of safety and wondering wondrous happy old sweden type if that is being yeah. triggered in me, it's still the feeling that I'm having. And then um, uh, the like, I will I will jump out of that again to see because you will. Uh, there's no reason to try and play on these feelings unless you're not feeling them all the time. You know. So so because uh -huh. we are in, we we have lost this now, we have to bring it back. And you see what I'm. That's what I meant when I said that. There's the same. It, it's no difference when you bring it up uh -huh. from memory, and then when you're feeling it now in response to a perception that you're having okay so essentially you're saying miriam that the um, the maybe the biological result is yeah. um there's no there's no difference there they're in, in yeah they're inseparable i mean the result of one is the exact same as the other josh is coming from the more phenomenological approach where they're experienced differently they may end up leading to a similar result physiologically yeah. biologically but they are still experienced differently right um how are these yeah. two connecting? I'm listening to both of you well, uh, yeah, coming but, from these two sides here. But I think there's there's a there's a further uh, there's a further issue. Well, so so I guess I mean biologically, right? I, I think there would be there would still be a difference between uh, immediate emotive responses and memories because they're activating different parts of the brain, right? So so when you have when you have a a a memory that is contributing to an emotion. Right. Then you're you're activating your memory, yeah. whereas if, if you're not if you're if you're in immediate uh, response to something you're not activating your memory at the same time. But but what's interesting about what mm. you said I think Miriam is that is that there's something about you might be able to inst if I, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly you might be able to instill a certain emotion emotional response yeah. with a false memory or with some other way of activating that feeling mm. and, get, and get the same result right so you have a, an advertisement or you, or you or you have a political speech or whatever it is right and, and you you can activate people's sense of longing for the past or their sense of comfort or actually we, we <laughs> were watching a, a food program last night the, the chef's table and uh, it was talking a, a lot of food preparing in terms mm. of uh, it is about evoking memories, right? It's about it's about right. the sense of comfort, that sense of when you grew up. I mean, these kind of things are really essential for making good experiences of food now <laughs> is to have that right. connection to the past. Right, by tying those, those sensory experiences so that are so foundational, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, smells and taste, right? I mean, those those tie us back into all of our experience. I mean, they're they're essential for... For our enjoyment of something in the present, but I mean, for me I'll, this I'll, hopped, hopped. But, <laughs> but for me this gets this gets really exciting because this is where I start to see how um, nostalgia can be not only complicated but also dangerous. And we start talking about memories that are are perhaps false yeah. or that can be sort of influenced or implanted in us um, non veridical memories that still lead to these responses. Uh, mm -hmm. th that seems to be um, open for manipulation and but, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, but there's. A not, I'm, I'm not willing to just go the pragmatist line and say, yeah. okay, well, as long as it leads to these certain <laughs> results, then fine. I mean, then we can throw away right. the truth behind it. But yeah, uh, if, if you told me that I, I did this as a child or showed me pictures of it and I never did, and it creates this feeling that gets me through yeah. the day, uh, I still want to say there's something that's gone wrong there, morally speaking. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the abs absolutely, but there's uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm totally agreeing, but raising a, a different concern, right? So a, par a parallel a parallel concern. So there, an article I read just recently talking about. Uh, um, well, I think the title of the article was uh, the importance of forgetting or something like that, and it was talking about the way in which the not just social media, but the way in which digitalization 
of everything. Uh, one of the negative consequences that we weren't necessarily expecting is that it makes it very difficult to forget. And and in, and there's a problem with that in this these terms. This is what the article talked about. Let's say you are a a, a teenager, a younger kid. Uh, um, for example, my daughter. I, just the other day, I thought about this. Uh, she was outside playing on the on the trampoline, and she was having a fantastic time, completely in her own world. Right? She was practicing whatever it was going on in her head. You know, just just experimenting. And there's something really important about being able to experiment and express without remembering that. Because if you have it documented, it means, you know, if you have it on in, in YouTube and then 20 years later, somebody can say, oh, yeah, but look, this is what you were. You were you were silly at this point or something like that. That's really detrimental because we need that freedom to be able to just grow and develop. Uh, so, so it's like there's there's an importance of being able to remember what actually happened, and then there's also really important to be able to forget certain aspects because they're they're not fully finished. We're not fully done yet. Right. We're just mm. we're developing. Mm. And if we document everything digitally and have a, a record of everything that we've ever done, then that can also be detrimental because we're not able to forget certain things that we've done. Uh, I have a brilliant quote that I have brought up so many times. I apologize if you heard it before. Um, uh, there are no memories uh, from the past, only of. Oh, good. And there are no memories from childhood, only of. And our job is oh. to constantly renew and replace the old version with a newer one. one. And there's another. Uh, oh, there's yeah, fascinating, another... fascinating. Yeah. Sorry. What? Uh, no, I'm. I'm just. I'm just thinking that that there's. We've got this account of how the the brain works of how memory works that is sort of let, that we are computers at this hard disk yeah. that it's space right that's been sort of pushed aside in in more recent research and studies that that's an old philosophical account of what the human being is that we in fact recreate memories every time that we remember them and in re recreating them we we add sort of textures and layers to them uh, and that's, I mean, that's important to to throw into this conversation when we're talking about looking back on our memories in order to draw from them in order to move forward. And then uh, I have another thing about um, attachment uh, theory, which is, you know, how you attach to yeah. other people. Uh, so there's a secure, you can do it securely and then uh, insecurely in, in two or three different ways. So one is avoidant, in, insecure, uh, avoidant, and one is anxious. We are trying to cling in on. Um, so very briefly. Um, so the uh, so for instance, if you have a story from your if your your childhood where something traumatic happened, if you have an anxious, uh, this is I just I'm just quoting from a, a book. Uh, so the anxious attachment style type person will tell you and tell you and tell you and keep talking about it, talking talk so much about what happened to you, cry and and want want you to understand and to listen to this. And mm. the avoidant. Um, attachment style person might say something like yeah you know my dad used to beat up my mom and we got her from hospital every second week but it was really okay so uh, mm. and then the secure attachment style person might uh, just tell you what happened and then uh, so the the secure attachment has to uh, the idea is that uh, there is a level of appropriateness between re oh. recalling the memory and the feeling that's attached to it that mm. there is a kind of since we can do this in a healthier or not so healthy way. Interesting. Yeah, you and, see. And yeah. what's the what's the marker of healthier as opposed to unhealthier? So the healthier is that uh, um, when you have, so if you're healthy and secure, you can be a sec uh, learned, uh, no, no, earned secure attachment uh -huh. style, where you have come from one of the other styles and you have worked through it a lot, uh, okay. which you know by years of therapy kind of mm -hmm. thing. And then, uh, so the mark of someone who's healthy is someone who can tell you what happened and mm -hmm. maybe cry a little bit and then say, oh, this still brings up emotion for me or mm -hmm. something like that. You so kind of, so it, that you're able to be, you, yeah. to remember with your uh, body right. type of thing, you know, right. Interesting. Uh, but you can still have language and, and uh, to right. talk about it and to explain what happened. And these, for instance, like we, we talked about commercials before. So mm. you have a very simple thing like someone eating a piece of chocolate and they go like, yeah. oh, you know. And yeah. uh, so the, the point is that you're, you're looking at it and you go like, I want to feel like that. Right. I'm yeah. going to get that chocolate thing. So 
that that's the simplest version of course so when you paint these stories of how wonderful things have been mm. and like we said you can only bring up things that have been since we don't mm. remember the future but you can paint a picture of the future and mm. this is what people <laughs> will mm. will say that you're just a, a visionary with no sense of um, you're not grounded in reality because it yeah. hasn't happened yet you know yeah great <laughs> Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, chocolate does sound like a really good idea right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're onto something there with the idea of, I mean, if we when we are remembering the past, um, I think yeah. once again, I mean, I'll land here in almost every one of these sessions is that we have an incredible need mm. to be critical when we yeah. are thinking about the phenomenon of nostalgia and memory in general. I mean, if we go back to the American wilderness example, mm. in the nostalgia to remember the great outdoors, the wilderness, what's conveniently skipped over is the messy history of the extermination of the native peoples, of this colonial uh, ideology behind it. Um, mm. and, and, and that's sort of conveniently forgotten when we look back in nostalgia to that time. When we think about uh, maybe in looking back into the, the great time of the 60s, right? Uh, we yeah. forget sort of the bad side of the revolutionary side of the politics in, in the 1960s in Sweden. Or if we look back to the 50s, we forget perhaps some of the the, the bad sides of the of the sexist categories that were in play that were um, quite harmful. And, and we're just sort of selectively pulling out things that we are remembering to get us to move ahead. Yeah. And that's, should, I think that's dangerous. Um, yeah. It can be very dangerous. Mm. We should suspend disbelief when we hear something that we're not uh, quite from, um, we don't know yet, but we should also suspend uh, judgment. Don't be so quick to say that this is all good and all bad. Really, if something, mm. if, if if we can learn anything at any time, it's mm. to just wait a little bit before you make your judgment. You know, check mm. one more time from the other side, like look from the other angle. Mm. Ha. Ah. Yeah, one one last maybe maybe, maybe we can maybe we can try to, to wrap it up because now we're now we're sort of giving our la our it sounds like we're giving our last thoughts about it. Uh, there was one other dimension that I thought would be good to add into all of this, which is um, the perhaps you could say the the difficulty of of specifying the what counts as accurate mm. history. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's exceedingly difficult. Uh, history can be anything that happened in the past, right? So it doesn't right. have to be a long time ago. Although a long time ago makes a big difference as well. But um, if you're talking about uh, just recent history, right? When did when did the coronavirus start spreading? How how did governments respond to it? I mean, you already see a very quick attempt to shape those stories in in particular ways, which is not a uh, maybe always bad because you have to you have to be able to talk about what's happened in some way and right. in doing so you shape it but right. but i guess i guess what what I, one caution maybe put it this way is that um it's not like there is a it's not like it's a simple uh story to go back to to uncover uh, of the way things were in the 1960s right. i mean i mean mm -hmm. it, it there were there were things that happened, and there were there are 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 documented. You know, there's ways of documenting it and so on, uh, right. verifying it. Perhaps you could put it in those terms. Um, but there's something important about also telling, having a narrative that puts it together into a story, into right. into a cohesive, cohesive picture. Because otherwise, uh, otherwise there's, there's almost no way of making sense of it. Right? So uh, there's like a ten I feel a tension. Mm, right. There's a tension between. But you need the story. Where, and and then you need to update it with a newer version when you get new data. Yeah, well, yeah, there, yeah. There's there's something about yeah, updating, updating. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's just a lot. Of, I feel like there's a lot of tensions there. I'm not sure what all yeah. to do with it. That, that that's what I'm I'm coming away with a lot of tensions. Put it that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I could probably not... jump in. I could probably jump yeah. in for my last thought and yeah. um, and it maybe question my own questions before. <laughs> <laughs> when I was trying to say it's so important when we talk yeah. about the, the veracity of our memories, um, and maybe I'm being a little bit too demanding there because there is this phenomenon um, called the, the, the fiction paradox or the paradox of fiction that we as human beings are able to feel and have emotional responses to things that are, are fictional, that are not true. 
Um, and it, I guess that really depends what we're talking about when we talk about true memories. In some sense, we never are able to get to those true memories. In some sense, every time we are remembering, we are in some sense living out the fiction paradox that we are being emotionally moved by something that maybe wasn't exactly like we're remembering. But in the end of the day, maybe we can't get around that. And in the end of the day, maybe that's actually good as long as that leads us in, in virtuous, good ways. Oh, good, yeah. But once again, um, with the caveat that we're not taking sort of false memories and then trying to instill them with power in a certain way that we're trying to control or manipulate other people. So I guess I, I'm trying to walk this sort of del delicate line here um, in, in questioning my own, my own questions about um, the, the, yeah. the truth of memories and what that means for the future. I'll end my thoughts there. Uh, I, I just have a quick final thought then uh. about the connection between the narrative and the feeling. Yeah. I think, I think there's something really big here about um, um, how, hmm, how the... Um, mm, the emotion that I am having like, in my body uh, mm. is always a uh, true, true, you know, there's not, I'm not mm. deceiving myself with this feeling, but the, mm. the story, the explanation to why, why I'm feeling what I'm feeling or the, the narrative that goes with it. Yeah. That is some, something that I can look at with uh, mm. questions and words and explanations and I can, uh, you know, so there's something, yeah, right, right. there's a lot, a lot to bring. Yeah, from this too, and to un to understand more about um, the truth of feelings, and and right. also, yeah, and like oh. what creates these feelings, you know, like Be it's Be beautiful, beautiful, Miriam, yeah. because what what you're doing is you're saying we recognize the reality of these emotional responses, but then we want to do an additional step mm -hmm. of asking mm -hmm. questions about the the journey, the the the, the reflection, the the way in which we get to those feelings, yeah. and yeah. ask questions about that, and yeah. how we understand nice. them. Like well, how yeah. we, how much we want to react on them, and or in what way we want to react on them. Good. You know. Yeah. 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 The ethics that we draw out of the feeling that we're having. Ah, that's a good so, ending, right? It's a nice picture yeah. of what we should be doing. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think we could probably end it there. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us for this uh, Skype session of Life Examine, and we look forward to seeing you all back here in the future. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. bye.